feeling and being a person who's in the story. I have to translate the words into words that you can understand as a person in a completely different context. With uh, Dr. Fabre Palaprad, that starts in his hometown, which was at that time known as Kord, C-O-R-D-E-S. Um, it was later renamed or given this, this Surasia, which means under the sky, mostly to attract tourists, I think. <laughs> it sounds a lot more romantic, I suppose. But um, the important thing about this is that, of course, it's in very well ensconced in the Latin world. It is not northern France, it is southern France. It is southwestern France. So. His home is how he grew up, is what he thinks, the, the food that he ate, the wine that he drank, the, the values that he got from his parents. And so I wanted to start with a sort of understanding of some of the things, at least, that I think he felt and learned when he was at Coral, uh, and what his people were doing, what his family was doing. Um, of course, it's very interesting that he is from Cold, which is in the department of Tarn, which departments didn't exist at the time of his birth in 1773. Um, departments were added under the Republic, the First Republic after the Revolution, so much uh, after he was born. Uh, but he's in the he was born in, also in the canton of Albi, which is a canton is a collection of municipalities. Um, and Albi is, of course, the, the city the largest city in what we would call a county, basically, um, near his village. Albi is the name that we get the Albigenses, right? The Albigensian crusade. So he, his name and everything about him bespeaks a uh, history of southwestern France that was unfortunate. But I think that it would be a leap of logic and a historical to say that he or his family were somehow harboring some kind of Cathar um, beliefs, because we know quite a lot about his extended family. So one branch of, of his family, the Palafra family, uh, were from Toulouse, which is the, the provincial capital. It's the largest city. Um, much larger than Albi. And these are, this would have been the sort of seat of power, and also, so people would have had a house in the village, and a house in town. And so the Palaprat family was fairly well off. His father was a surgeon, and uh, they were a pretty well respected group of people. Uh, one of whom was uh, a fairly famous poet in the 17th century. But some of, the, some of his family members were also what they call Capitul, which are, uh, Toulouse maintained uh, out of an ancient custom its own council, sort of like a mini parliament. And so his family were members by virtue of the fact that they were uh, well educated and uh, at different times, people who were in the gentry, at least, they participated in the local government. And I'll show you. 
Now this is Jean Palaprat. He, he was born in 1650 and died in 1721. Um, he's, uh, he's a direct ancestor of uh, Dr. Albert Palaprat. Uh, he was a, a lawyer, a playwright, and uh, a fairly, uh, actually he was received very well at, at, during his life. So he was uh, at the Comédie Française, which uh, you know is a very illustrious place for uh, someone who was a playwright to have his things put into public. Um, and uh, his actually his plays were published posthumously, and you can still buy them even online <laughs> if you are uh, interested. So he is the first, I, as far as I know, Jean Palaprat is the first Palaprat to move to Paris because Paris became more important. Um, remember that that part of France was historically not part of France, actually. Where he came from was originally under the kingdom of Aragon as a sort of vassal state. So it wasn't until uh, very much later, under uh, a series of different wars and so forth, that. Uh, the French crown asserted its, its authority over the Languedoc, so the western part, uh, uh, west of Provence, so right against the Pyrenees, from the Pyrenees up to the center of the country. So that's a little bit about his sort of geographical and family history, because I don't think we've ever really talked about that. But I think it's very important to understand the man, because He's coming from a background that is purely Latin in nature. That is to say, the most important crops are wheat and grapes. It's a very communal, very in-your-face kind of relationship with family and with other people around you. Uh, and for an English-speaking audience, it's difficult to understand the way that you learn how to deal with other people in the world, unless you have grown up that way. So the do des that we were talking about earlier from the ancient Roman religion of I give, therefore, so that you can give, is very much ingrained in that type of culture. I, I mentioned wheat and, and grapes, obviously, it has to do with being a priest, but it also has to do with being community. Because in that part of in that part of the world, the survive the collective survival happens because there are these many little things which are brought together, which are extremely labor intensive. If you've ever had to <laughs> to pick or harvest and and um, process wine or grapes into wine, you'd understand how many people are involved in that. It's an enormous undertaking. And wheat is the same thing, right? To go from field to loaf. Very much a communal experience. And one that requires loyalty and large families. And that's something that, you know, is usual love Italians or Spanish or in this case, um, people from the southern part of France. So he's by no means unusual in that, in that way. And his religion was not unusual. <coughs> Being a person from that part of the world, he felt a calling to the priesthood at a time when being a priest was extremely uncool. <laughs> because already he, he started studying in Kao, uh, which isn't too far from his uh, hometown in 1786, well, you know what happened a few years later. And that the, the French Revolution is not something that just happened overnight, right? It's, it's a, a social upheaval that happened all over the place at different times and started popping out um, long before 1789. But in, after, you can see that he was tenacious because he did believe in what he was doing because by even the year after the revolution, he was ordained a priest. That uh, really, at the same time, you're seeing there are things going on that would later affect his life, 
such as some of the names that you heard spoken yesterday at Mass. The Grand Master of the Order of the Temple uh, was the Duke José de Poissac. He was killed at the Versailles Massacre in September of 1792, just around the same time that Dr. Fabri Palabar was, was being on a priest, graduating from his first, um, his first university, really. So these things were going on around him, and he was certainly not aware of any of those things that were going on in Paris, uh, at least not, not when it comes to the esoteric side of his life. He didn't know Costa de Moisac from Adam at that point. <coughs> but he, he went on, and um, it probably became impossible for him. I say probably because I don't want to make any assertions that I can't uh, prove. I, I don't think that it was tenable for him to stay in the priesthood. Um, even, so I'm going to assume that people know a little bit about the French Revolution. It was extremely secular in nature and uh, extremely violent against uh, the church <coughs> in particular for reasons that make sense, but which sort of got out of hand. And uh, it, it resulted in the slaughter of, well, hundreds of thousands of people actually, and the destruction of a lot of uh, precious <coughs> statuary and uh, other um, human heritage, which is a real a, a loss for us. If you've ever been to France, you'll, you can't help but run into churches where they'll say, well, in that niche used to be because that's what happened <coughs> after the revolution. So it was extremely inhospitable. <coughs> And I touched on that in the lecture on the Leviticon, that the Seneca sisters were uh, actually instituted after the French Revolution in order to help people and to repair that and to, to offer some solace and some means of spiritual rejuvenation in a way that would also help people physically. Um, and so our, <coughs> the, the beginnings of Dr. Fabre Palafrat's foray into his adulthood and into his new career uh, would be very much tied up in that kind of work. Being a person who, as I said, was raised in this kind of environment, by the way, those are seminarians, not <laughs> obviously from the time that he graduated, but it's the same seminary mm. in the 19th century, the early 19th century. And the altar there is the altar in, in the cemetery that he went to. Um, so he enrolled himself. He, be, being a person who grew up in this environment, I think that he just had a vocation. You can see that he had a vocation to help people. And so I think being a resourceful person, and also being the son of a surgeon, um, he turned to medicine. Uh, he, he enrolled in 1794. So. <clears throat> The year after he was ordained a priest, he enrolled in medical school. And again, it's not entirely clear what his intentions were, but I know that he wanted to do something that was useful. And in those days, especially right after the revolution, I think that he probably thought that being a doctor and being able to help people in a physical way would be of tremendous use to his country. So by 1798, he graduated from medical school. Also, also in Van. And he moved to Paris. He went right where the, where everybody was trying to run away from. Paris was not a popular town at that point. Particularly not among young, well-educated bourgeoisie, you know, from the South. I mean, there would have been no reason. He was clearly a Roman Catholic with good <laughs> Roman Catholic uh, credentials. Um, no, undoubtedly a pious person. <coughs> not particularly revolutionary, in that sense at least. And I, as far as we know, didn't have any interest other than in, I should say, the, we do know from his writings that of course he believed in the fundamental principles of the rights of, of humanity, the, the, the fundamental principle of having free discourse and freedom of thought. He did very strongly believe in those things. But he comes from a generation that is really coming to its 
fullness in the Napoleonic era. That's where his idealism, his religion, and his medicine, you could say, all blossom. So it's in that period that the young Fabri Palafra became interested in Freemason. He joined the Grand Orient de France. He actually was a member of There you have the <coughs> Chevalier de la Croix, which means the Knights of the Cross, uh, within the Grand Orient de France, which is, for those of you who don't know, the, the principal uh, uh, Masonic organization in France. The, there, are, there is another one, but that's the largest one. So this is where he met Jacques Philippe Ledoux who was born in 1754 and died in 1832. Um, so he was just slightly older than Dr. Fabre Pellepro. He was a member of the French National Academy of Medicine, and he was later the mayor of fontenay cou um, So he was a friend of Fabre Pellepro from the very beginning, from his arrival in Paris, and he was a, a high-ranking Freemason. But more interestingly, for our story anyway, Leder was the eldest son of a, uh, sort of a, an interesting character in European history who's known as Komu. He was part physicist, magician, and illusionist. Uh, he was actually uh, very much involved in court circles. And uh, as a result, the, his son, this Lidru, was, uh, got a position as the, the, the physician to the Duke of Cosse de Brissac. So that, that is the, this is Dr. Faber Palafrat's first um, steps in meeting people who are uh, high ranking. Uh, members of what we call the Order of the Temple. So how he fits into the Fabre Palafort's life is actually rather serendipitous, other than the fact that they met as Freemasons. Um, <laughs> as I told you, the Duke of Brissac was killed at Versailles. Well, after the Duke's death, Ledru purchased some of his furnishings in which uh, he, he found what we now know as the Charter of Larminius, the Statutes of the Order of the Temple, and the question and answer section of what would later become the Leviticon that, dated, that were dated to at least 705. Uh, 1705, sorry. That I didn't know. I didn't know the catechism can, stuff. Can you repeat what you just said? Yes. <laughs> I just want to make sure I so sort yeah. That. Just so everyone understands, you can you can get some corroboration on these uh, interesting facts from François Timolion Beg Clavel. His name is so. His last name is Clavel, C L A V E L. His name is François Timolion, and. I can give you the name of it. It's called L'Histoire Pittoresque de la Front Maçonnerie et des Sociétés Secrètes Anciennes et Modernes. It, is, it was published contemporaneous to his life in 1844. So I'll repeat. So Ledru, the friend of Dr. Faber Palafar was the son of this illustrious magician and physicist. After the Duke's death, so he got a job as the physician to the Duke because of his father's notoriety. Okay. Philippe. Correct. Okay. Yes. Um, and it was the custom of the day when someone died 
for the people who are his employed or friends or family to be able to purchase their furnishings, either to help the widow with their money or just out of maybe they didn't want it anymore or they were liquidating their estate. So he bought furniture. I don't know how much furniture. It doesn't say. It just says furnishings. And in the furnishings, he found the Charter of Larmenius, the Statutes of the Order of the Temple, and the initiatory, this is small letters, small, not capitals. It says literally the initiatory book of questions and answers, 1705, and that they were hidden. So I don't think they were just in there. I think they might have been in a secret scarf or something like that. Sometimes people had false bottoms mm -hmm. on their drawers and things like that. So is the implication then that LeDru knew that the secret compartment was there and bought that particular piece of furniture? I make I know I draw no such oh. conclusions. I will then. <laughs> <laughs> I'll leave that to you. Then. <laughs> the important thing I think that you remember, however, is that to the best of my ability, I have given you sources which are contemporary sources first-hand accounts or letters from Dr. Faber Pellafra himself. And I'd be happy to give you, in fact, I have the original. None of these things are translated, so you have to you have to do your homework with Google Translate the best you can, but um, I can give you a list of, of publications, at least that Dr. Faber Pellafra himself wrote, which I think are all very interesting. But I don't want to get too sidetracked on, on this yet, because um, this, the, the, so, because he, uh, Dr. Faber Palafra, just like the modern Joanite Church, is a person who ha who is bivocational throughout his life, right? So he he, um, he works as the sovereign pontiff and patriarch later um, for the rest of his life, but he's also a surgeon and a researcher, more importantly, in um, new types of medicine. So, but I will finish the Ledru story just so that we can put that to bed. Um, so Ledru showed these documents to his friend and colleague, Dr. Faber, in early 1804. This, according to uh, Big Clavel, inspired the men to revive the order of time. So that's the story of that. Of course, I'm sure that there was a relationship between the Duke of Brissac and other people, but I'm not going to jump to those conclusions. I'm just going to leave it where it is. This is pointless, really. So we all know about the, <laughs> the, the discovery of the Leviticon. Well, I'm not so sure anymore about that, because since I've been doing this research, I've, I've stumbled on at least two or three different dates for that discovery. Mm -hmm. And... I'm not exactly sure because now we know, I think that this is pretty reliable, um, that the other portions of the texts, or the, the, you could say the important texts which were foundational to the Order of the Temple, then of course to the, the Joanite Church later, um, come in at different times. And so now we see that we have those, the, we have these three documents which which are very, very important. The discovery, I think the confusion is mostly, it's not a huge discrepancy, but within a, a couple of years, I think the discrepancy might be the difference between saying, I found it and here it is. Because it needed to be translated, and I've, I've gone over that before in the, in, in the Leviticon lecture. It was actually quite a long process. It took a long time just to find someone who could translate it just like in English. It took a long time to do. So he, he uh, so here we see a little bit of the background, just because we're in the 1790 to 18, say, 04 range of time, that there are sources which say specifically that uh, the, the Duke of Brissac, Grand Master of the Order of the Temple, um, made Radix, Radix de Chevillon regent of the order and sent the archives to be kept in his care. Um, 
but we have no reason to believe that they actually got there. I think that's been the confusion. So I think that there are some things which were and some things which were not. I would imagine some stuff also gets mixed up in the, to the founding or refounding of those organizations as well, because I mean, I've seen 1804, 1810, 1814, <laughs> yeah. you know, all thrown around. Yeah. But we do know something about um, Radis de Chevillon. Uh, it was, so, at the, at the beginning of the idea in 1804 to, to, uh, to bring the Order of the Temple back to life, as it were, the real story behind this is that there was no general convent, there was no meeting of the Order. It existed, but it had been completely dormant, and the people who were involved in it, of course, the, the last Grand Master was murdered. <coughs> that sounds familiar. <laughs> um, so they're they're actually looking for a way to find their way out of it, to refound, to, to begin again. Let's see here. But let's let's go back to. Uh, Let's go back to Dr. Faber Calabrata's man. So while all this is going on, and he's going to these very interesting meetings at night, <laughs> he's a very busy person. So between 1800 and 1838, his, Dr. Faber Calabrata's leadership in the advancement of medicine, philanthropy, and the arts is well documented. I have a list. I will just go through the list because there I'll tell you the history behind each one of these uh, things. So he's a Knight of the Legion of Honor, which is the highest civilian and military order in France. It was given him in, in 1814 after the Siege of Paris. He was a doctor of the Faculty of Medicine in Paris, which means that he was teaching medicine. He was the director general of the Société Médico Philanthropique, which was basically a free clinic for the poor and for the people of his part of Paris. Uh, and that's something that he did. He was actually appointed um, during the Napoleonic era, and he continued to do it for quite some time. But beyond that, going back to his roots as a person who grew up in sort of the, the great Roman tradition, you could say, um, he was very much interested in the arts and literature. He was the president of the, the Athenaeum of Arts in Paris. He was the president of the Royal Society of Sciences, the president of the Royal Antiquarian Society of France president of the Galvanic Society of France, which was the organization which studied the use and application of electricity in both mental and physical health, sort of like Dr. Frankenstein. <laughs> <laughs> um, and this actually became his specialty. And later, he was uh, the winner of the Medaille d'Or, which is uh, the city of Paris is uh, civilly an honor to people who have done the city, the people of, of Paris, a uh, great honor, which we'll get into in a minute. So before, if we want to believe that the Leviticon was, um, that he discovered it in 1804, uh, the year before that, he co-founded the National Society for the Study of Electrochemical Treatments, known as galvanism, or the use of electricity in medical procedures. He worked feverishly to find ways of using technologies such as these to help his patients and was credited with developing a cure for some types of tumors which were previously impossible to treat. So he would have used, he was experimenting with um, mechanisms. If you've ever seen that show Oddities on television, sometimes they have those glass wands with a little bulb on top of it and there's a beam of 
electricity, sort of like a little lightning bolt. And you still see them around. People used to use it for stimulating their hair growth, or um, it was sort of a panacea. <laughs> no, Your Grace, I'm not looking at you. <laughs> so they would, you know, apply it to whatever hurt, and it was supposed to help. But actually, there were some um, important advancements in people who had suffered from really serious um, psychological disorders and using a jolt of electricity, however barbaric, um, sometimes works. And I think that that was uh, one of the outcomes of some of the research that was going on at that time. So very much earlier than many people think. I couldn't help but notice, I couldn't help but notice in the time of the education that we took in, um, significantly longer to become a priest than a surgeon. Oh. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah, and remember that actually, you know, it was just around this time that uh, <coughs> surgeon, the profession of surgery, was changing from sort of nothing, uh, uh, sort of uh, over glorified barber, into a person, into a that's science, like scientist. Barber, <laughs> yeah. Surgery went from here by down this to make this better. <laughs> so we know that sometime between 1804 and 1806, at any rate. Um, a couple of things happened in his esoteric work. He, uh, Dr. Fabre Palofrad, um, suggested, I think, that that his friend, Ledru, serve as the new Grand Master of the Order of the Temple. I think that was the general consensus because he was older, um, but he was young enough to be able to handle the, the, the charge. Remember that back then it was very difficult to travel, um, and if you were old and infirm, it was extremely painful and difficult to get around. So, if you were in charge of an organization and you had to uh, go from city to city, because we know that the Order of the Temple and later the Jonah Church had um, parishes and priories all over France, there were at least four or five uh, big ones. Uh, it would have cost an enormous amount of energy. Plus, just being in charge of an organization like that is difficult. So I think that was uh, part of it. And Ledru seemed to be a very bright person and very well connected. But he refused. And instead, he nominated Radice de Chevillon, who wouldn't accept anything except the title regent, which he inscribed in the charter. De Chevillon uh, was getting along in years and soon nominated Dr. Fabre Palafra. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but are you, are you telling us that LeDru became the, the head of the order because he ordered furniture? Or because he paid for furniture? I mean, is, is it just the passing of the charter that made the next guy the next guy? No, but he wasn't. He refused. Why did they, well, the, they the choose him? He was never the Grand Master. Okay. He was never the Grand Master. It's just, there, it's was also, there was also a new issue, just like, uh, I mean, except for the except for the initial point of the Larminia's transmission itself, which was done um, atypically in, in person to a person in a situation of uh, emergency here, like the earlier order of the temple, it was, it was an election. Of, yeah. But I, I'm just kind of curious, that, like looking at this slide here, that Polycott was raised to the height. Is this the same Philippe Le Drew? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Nominated. Nominated. He was raised to the height of the Order of the Temple by Le Drew. I, I'm just trying to figure out like how Le Drew was being a well, member. Well, by this in the sense that he was part of the, the group of people who elected. Okay. He was in a position. He, I mean, he was. He had been nominated. So. Uh, under the usual customs, I think people would have assumed that he would take it, but he didn't. 
So we'd assume that like LeDrew was friends and that's why he bought the furniture, I get that point. But like so close to the point that finding something so secure and sacred and whatever is something to be like, oh, well this was my uncle's and I know it's important but I'm gonna hold on to it and, and eventually give it to the right people or? Well, I think that um, there's no record of what, of what the conversations were, but so it was brought into it was brought into the um, you could say because Fabri Palaprat was a member of the Order of the Cross, he was privy to this information. It's clear that was Ledru a member of that order? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So it and just kind of belongs so to the were, order. Well, all of these people were. Okay. And they were very high ranking in the so Grand the order, order of the Cross. The the Order of the Cross becomes the Order of the Temple, or the Order of the Temple springs out of the Order of the Cross? They, I, I mean, it looks to me, sorry, it looks to me like they overlap. They yeah. overlap, yeah. Okay. They, they are distinct. All right. Th there is another organization, that, so I can show you um, something else in his life where, let's see here, um, So when Sean dies, if I buy the contents of his house, and there's something important in there, do I and do I get the benefits that come with it? Is what I'm asking. No, like, yeah. like, oh, so. only, but that's the thing. Only if the rest of the organization says, Joey. I think it's got to be that, that right. he knew where the secret documents were in that particular desk, right. and bought that desk. I mean, it, it doesn't. Yes, that that certainly. That certainly makes sense. We yeah. have no proof of that, but no, that, right, right, that's right. a reasonable. Yeah. It's not an unreasonable supposition. The, the other thing is, is there's 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 a, a, a kind of thing going on that said, oh, you know, we 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 got this, yeah, we got this stuff, and then we did this thing. Well, I mean, you know, further than just knowing it was there, is knowing why it was there, what it was doing, there was already an active involvement or you know some right. discussion. So. It's, it's not getting something and then belonging to that. It's acquire, uh, potentially acquiring something that already falls under your, you know what I mean? Because there was already connection or already involvement mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, just securing stuff. But, you know, that's that's what I would think. I mean, there's no proof of that, right? But there's also uh, some suspicion <coughs> that the Larminia's charter itself was was forged by the Jews. Sure. Yeah. So. Th there is, yeah. Well, yeah. what's the authority behind the L. Arminius Charter? Like, that, I guess that's what I'm trying to get to, is that, like, when does the Arminius Charter be the be-all-end-all? Be all? After Demolet. Okay. So well, that's, 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 that's the supposed yeah. successor to Jacques Demolet. Well, and I get that, but what I'm saying is that Le Drew bought the Charter. He technically well, bought the Charter. Yes. Yeah. Okay. It's in his possession, and and if he wasn't such good friends and such an honest guy with these people, <laughs> it would have been lost. You know. So, but, but does that mean that the authority or the power or whatever that comes with it that has to do with these orders or the church or anything? What does that mean? No, he was already a well, member of those orders. But what that's, does that mean? Yeah, that the church is a succession that comes with it, or anything? It, it, it was no, just it's, circumstance. It's, it's, it's the documentation for the stuff. It's like finding a letter of Thomas Jefferson behind a picture frame. Like it doesn't change American history or American future. It's just finding a letter. Well, I mean, it would yeah. be it would be like buying, you know, I'm, if if his eminence were to pass away and you buy his desk, and in the in a false bottom of the desk you find his will and nice testament, guys. and you take it to me and Tim for us to execute. Right. Yeah. I mean, the fact that you had it and and gave it to us, you know, it doesn't give you any authority, right? But we can still act upon. Okay. Or he made it all up, and it sounds really cool. And yeah. Or or Lidger forged the whole yeah, yeah. thing, and, yeah. and that's all there is to it. Who knows? I'm just. I was just wondering if you had it, like a shoebox. No, 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 no. Okay. No, the well, is, <laughs> the well, no. charter is in England. Yeah, no, yeah. It's, yeah. yeah, it's in uh, uh, Mark Mason's Mark Hall. Mason's the, yeah. uh, the so, if I could continue. Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, we're. It, it's a, it's a legitimate question because in these uh, in this uh, world, there are lots of accusations that people made up the documents. For us as a church, it means little or nothing actually, <laughs> because 
things have changed. We have the apostolic lineage uh, through other means, and the, the 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 tradition of John is one that we hold near to our hearts, regardless of who gave what piece of paper to whom at what time. But this is uh, this is clearly important to Fabre Palaprat at the time because I think. Uh, of his intentions to help people uh, on both a physical and a spiritual level. And when he became a Freemason, it's clear to me that he started to understand the importance of some of the esoteric knowledge that you can learn as a Freemason, and that it can be applied very effectively to the administration of life whether it's as a doctor or as a politician or as a priest. And I don't think that he saw any um, difference or wall or veil in between any of those things. I think he saw them and they were very definitely a part of himself as a person, very much a part of his being. So I find it very difficult as well, let's face it, probably one of the experts on Fabre Palaprat in the world, <laughs> that he won't, that he would have engaged in activity with Medru that was somehow nefarious or made up, knowing it. It just, it doesn't fit anything that the man did. Now, people do stupid things all the time. But this is not a man to be trifled with. This is a person who is one of the most serious people I have ever really read about uh, in any field, in any history. I have never seen someone who was had a single-minded approach to trying to help people. At the same time, having a really healthy um, understanding and appreciation for both mysticism and ritual in his life and in the life of uh, his church in the order of the temple and, and his work with other people was sort of a product of it. So it doesn't look like a guy who took shortcuts in order to go in there. Right, exactly. Yes. Yeah. It doesn't so what the chatter, the sort of low intensity chatter you see coming from even Masonic corners in the nineteenth century about him and about Ligru, I feel is sour grapes. Mm -hmm. Plain and simple. Because if you read it Sometimes they don't even get their facts straight. And they tell stories, and especially in the Anglo-Saxon world, in the Masonic so-called histories of the Order of the Temple, sometimes they're just plain old wrong about facts and people. So not to say that there wasn't that going on in France, absolutely there was. But as you see uh, throughout his life, he, he not only strives to do things which are of immense help to people, but he uses himself as the principal tool and vehicle to make those things happen. I just don't see a forger or a person who is interested in trying to somehow make himself out as being greater than he was. I don't think he needed to do that. I don't think it's inconceivable to think that he may have been taken advantage of by well, duplicitous people, because often people of his of his nobility of character are right. often <laughs> some of the right. easiest to do. But he was also clearly not a stupid man. No, no. But I think that this, um, so to back up a bit for those of you who don't understand, the, the so th this order of the temple was an organization which had existed prior uh, to this. It was sort of a gentleman's club inside of Versailles, inside of the royal family and the nobility of France, and at certain periods in history was probably just that. It probably had, probably very similar to, to Freemasonry in the sense that it had, um, it had its own rituals, it had its own history, uh, and it was based on, on Templarism. Um, it might have included at times, depending on who was the Grand Master, um, more wine, women, and song than one might think would be appropriate to a serious uh, esoteric organization, and then again, maybe not. Uh, but 
over over a period of about 200 years, sorry, about 100 years before him, there are references to organizations which are clearly holding this, the seed of this organization uh, within them. Who are following with this Armenius Charter and adding their names to the bottom, that kind yeah, of thing? That kind of thing. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and it takes on various names. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, if it was a forgery, it could be a forgery that was already up to 100 years old. Sure. Yeah. Right. Yeah. right. Yeah. The, I think, and, and I've talked about that before in the, in the Leviticon, um, when I gave the presentation on the Leviticon, that uh, you're talking about what was possibly forged by a Jesuit priest. Yeah. Um, Bonani's name was uh, in the 17th century, so... That's possible, again, that's possible. Uh, but somehow the organization and the ideals of the organization continue. So regardless of whether or not he was led astray by the Drew, um, he was absolutely committed to what he was doing, and he took it very seriously. And I think that for the Apostolic Jewish Church, that's particularly important, because our own history has been one of, of a great deal of mystery in the past, and of some people not taking their charge seriously, frankly, and that, that's something that we need to, to remember. That just because you have an organization like the Roman Catholic Church or the AJC, where some people are not doing what they should be and not taking their charge seriously or, or hurting other people or doing whatever, it doesn't mean that the entire organization uh, or the, the spirit that it carries should be thrown out of the, the bathwater, as it were. There's also uh, uh, Western esotericism is holy in the last two, <laughs> 200 years with, with you know, the uh, Springfield Correspondence Cipher Manuscript of the Golden Dawn, um, you know, the uh, charter from Bronny Prince Charlie to, uh, I think it was, was it to Martinez de Pasquale's father, yeah. which, you know, may or may not have happened, right? And so, you know, all these things where it's questionable or Questionable origin should equal questionable organization, but that's not, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and, and a lot of these cases, it's, it's simply, it's not that they're real or fake, it's that there's, there's, some, there's just no way to prove it either way. It's right. so long gone. Yeah. So, uh, so if, you, if you judge a man by the people he, surround, you know, he surrounds himself with, um, he rises to the top of society during the Napoleonic era. He becomes not only, I mean, he knows Napoleon. He's not just there, he knows him. He, Napoleon is very much aware of the order of the temple, its importance, its potential political significance for France at the time. Um, and it also meshes very well with Napoleon's own free thinking ideas when it comes to religion and his uh, ideals when it came to a sort of imperial approach to freedom and human rights, which he very much believed in. Some people forget that Napoleon was a spreader of constitutionalism in most of continental Europe. In fact, there are many countries that still have um, codes because of him, including the state of Louisiana. <laughs> but the important thing to remember here is that um, Faber Palaprat is at the very highest level of society, but he's also working in a clinic, helping poor people in his community. I mean, he take, he he took a, he took the court position with Napoleon as the as the foot doctor to the emperor, which was sort of like being, you know, now in the in the household of Queen Elizabeth, um, you know, the head chamberlain or something like you know somebody who used to have some kind of um, physical role in the household. And it's sort of an honorary title to get you invited to the cocktail parties and, uh, and so that you have a reason to come to court. So that, that, is, that is what he was doing. He was um, very much involved and in, in, invited into the court of Napoleon. Um, and when, let's see here, the... Um, anniversary of Jacques de Molay, the death of Jacques de Molay, was actually celebrated in the Church of Saint Louis with, dur during the period that uh, Napoleon was uh, emperor. Napoleon sent his personal guard uh, to do the procession uh, very solemnly with um, 
a mysterious canon from the from the from Notre Dame Cathedral called Arnal. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and so wait, so wait, Arnal was in the, was involved in that. Yeah, Arnal. Um, so between so the apex you could say of uh, of the Napoleon slash Doctor Faber Palaprat romance, <laughs> if you will, is uh, between eighteen oh four and eighteen ten. And uh, obviously, this is a very busy time for Napoleon, so he didn't have a lot of time to think about esoteric orders and new churches for a new sort of free French empire throughout the world. Um, but he did spend quite a lot of time, and one of the one of the things that he did was to to do great honor to the uh, to the Knights uh, Templar uh, by having this huge state celebration right in the middle of Paris in a, in a, in a Catholic Roman Catholic church. So just to dispel any rumors, the um, as far as I can tell from any of the any of the sources that I looked at, um, the consecration of there were actually two consecrations of Dr. Fabre Palafred. Uh, well, yeah, so uh, he was already a Roman Catholic priest, uh, but he was consecrated as a bishop um, by Arnal and Moviel and Salomon. Salomon was um, still a Roman Catholic. Constitutional bishop, right? I, uh, they, what, the, the Mobile was, yeah, they were all Mobile constitutional bishops. Yeah. bishops. Uh, I think in, uh, the thing that's interesting about uh, Arnaud is that uh, I believe that happens before Mobile, and, but, and Mobile is the one that's connected to the order of the Temple and the General Church, but Arnaud um, is identified by title as, as being uh, before. Is, is, I mean, time-wise being before, but identified as being Joan. Mm -hmm. So that, that there was a lineage that he received before all of this. Right. But tracing it from our uh, back further there. I mean, we know where all this stuff goes, both from the Larminius lineage and, of course, the Roman Catholic lineage from uh, the constitutional uh, Bishop Moviel, but there's a, you know, there's a, uh, a prior consecration from the from source mm -hmm. because already beyond that point. But the, so the preponderance, preponderance of the, the, the sources that I have uh, say, you have two dates, 1804 and 1810, so Arnaud would have been involved in the first one in 1804. That was, and that was not as the primate, or I mean as the patriarch and the uh, son of yeah. pontiff, right? Yeah. Uh, that would have been just as just as, but as the yeah. Grand Master of the Order of the Temple. Mm -hmm. uh, that so the Episcopacy was clear. attached? The time? Episcopacy was attached to the Grand Master. Okay. Yes. Historically or just at that time? I, okay. I'm to say. But that's the way, that's, that's, the, that's the way, uh, no, that's, uh -huh. that's the way it goes in the institutional narrative. Right? Yeah. Right. That's it's the way, the, right. We know that that's the way it goes in, in the tradition. Now, I have found that at least there are some records to indicate that that is exactly what happened between 1804 and 1810. Yeah. So, um, who he is, I think that all of the people who were involved as clerics in the Order of the Temple were Roman Catholics. Okay? They were Roman Catholics who were secretly or not so secretly members of the Order of the Temple. And I think that under, it makes all, this, all the sense in the world that that would have been a thing because they were they were under the protection of the crown before. And you see later in, in Fabre Palafrat's uh, life that the fight, the, the, the fight in between um, the more liberal element within the Roman Catholic Church in the, in the Orléans and Bourbon families. Because for those of you who went to Mass yesterday, you heard all those names. Some of them are Conti, Condé, Orléans, Bourbon. They're all, they're all the royal family members. One of them was a prince of the blood. Yeah. Um, and what, so supposedly one of the grandmasters who was uh, killed, Philippe Orléans, went to the, that during the uh, Reign of Terror who supported, by the way, the, the ideals of the revolution and supplied it with a place to meet. 
So, so what you're seeing in, in the life of Dr. Faber Kalaprat is actually a division between not only in the Catholic Church of sort of progressive and, and not so progressive, but also in the, you could say, freedom and democracy and human rights movement, <coughs> which had its extremes. And they definitely separate. And so Napoleon is important because he brings together the two threads. He brings together this the more traditional, not so crazy, not guillotining everybody because they read, you know, Madame Bovary or something, and, and bringing the other side of the Catholic Church. So clerics who were constitutional bishops, so therefore they were, you know, de facto they were going to be more liberal than their predecessors in their in their social policies. So most of these people were, as you can see, abolitionists. Every single bishop who was involved and surrounded by Faber Palafrat was an abolitionist. This is a, a very important part of his belief system. So he's, he believes in the importance of tradition and of the traditional ways, but he also is very much uh, involved in trying to better, to, to introduce uh, progress in, your, in European life and non-European life, for the, in, in Haiti, for example. So we know that uh, Guillaume Mobile, even though he's a Norman, he's not Haitian, he's from Normandy. Um, his friend Mobile was a, was a constitutional bishop, a, a Roman Catholic bishop, who was uh, the bishop of, uh, of what is now Haiti. And one of the things that he did when he was there was champion abolitionism. So he was uh, definitely a progressive sort. So this is this is the apex. This is really this is where the the order of the temple and Dr. Faber Palafrat become get their fifteen minutes of fame. Well, it's a few years. Uh, unfortunately, well, not unfortunately, I should say, there are things that happened um, after this that uh, didn't bode very well. But it's also important for him, I think, spiritually. I think that there's something that very definitely changed. I think that he um, was looking for something, and he managed to, to find it when the understanding of the message of the Gospel of John was revealed to him. And he talks about that um, in letters to people. He talks about how. Um, you know, even though it sounds really haughty, that the being the pontiff, the sovereign pontiff of the Joanite tradition, was distinctive, and in his view, its time had really come. He said, uh, "I'll read you something that he wrote to a friend of his." He said, "Well, I can talk openly. Yes, I am pope." You may say that the Pope is in Rome, but know that the Pope in Rome is the Pope in the order of St. Peter, and that I am Pope according to the order of St. John. St. Peter has not received the high initiation. That is why the, the Popes who descended from him have taught in error. St. John, however, only John, was initiated by Jesus, his master, who himself had been initiated by the initiators of Egypt. Now I am the direct and legitimate successor of St. John. So in my hands lies the torch of truth to shed light for the human race. It has been revealed by Kabbalistic calculation that the time had come to shine the torch. Those mm. not mincing words. <laughs> so, so that's the backdrop of the beginning, really, of his life. I mean, can you imagine the man just graduated again from school <laughs> and started a medical practice and started all these things, and then, uh, you know, by 1814, all hell breaks loose because the the alliance, right, um, was getting stronger. The British, the Russians, the Austrians, 
the Spanish, even the Portuguese were getting um, help from the English to revolt against France, against the French Empire. And in, in 1814 they were successful in coming down from what is now Belgium, and, and uh, we were talking about this yesterday, anybody who knows anything about French geography knows that, well, there's really nothing there, it's completely flat, so if you get your land army um, in Belgium on the French border, you can pour into the northern part of France and walk, basically march to Paris within a day or so. And that's exactly what happened. Paris was under siege, and Fabre Palaprat found himself and his emperor in big trouble. But instead of giving up, he stuck around. He didn't hide who he was or what he was doing or what he believed in. And he spent five or six weeks of every single day, he almost worked himself to death. He did it again later in his life. Um, working in a field hospital in the middle of the street, taking care of all the wounded from the Allied invasion of Paris. For that, he was nominated and got the, um, the Legion of Honor that same year. But his life didn't get any easier. He might have been given a medal, but in two years' time, somebody was back on the throne, um, not very well known, <laughs> Louis XVIII, who was extremely conservative. He came from that part of, remember, that part of the Orléans and Bourbon family, which was very conservative. There was a Protestant, actually the Conti and the Conde, where they were uh, Protestant leaning. There was uh, the Orléans, who were uh, more liberal and liberal Roman Catholics, and they, they supported, like I said, the revolution and some other things. Uh, and then there was the really, really conservative uh, Louis XVIII, who um, was on the throne for 10 years and made Fabre Palafrat's life a living hell. I never knew about this part. So basically they, they, they just um, used sort of terror tactics. They knew that he was very friendly with, uh, with Napoleon. And, and they also, I'm sure, knew that he was uh, a big Freemason. And so there were what we would call illegal searches and seizures of, of materials they were trying to find, he thought anyway. Um, he, told his friends that he thought that they were out to get the documents that he had, particularly the statue. So this is why I think that it's not, that's, this is why I believe that Ledru, Philippe Ledru, was not scheming. Because if Ledru was making all this up, and all these documents that were found in the furniture of the Duke de Prisac, were false, or he made them up, or he added to them, why would the authorities of a, of a right-wing Catholic monarch even care to find those documents, or particularly to, to do anything with a doctor, who had a very good reputation otherwise, right, other than being a, a supporter of Napoleon. And remember that they were, there were not summary executions for being a supporter of Napoleon after, after um, he was disgraced, okay? That's, that's not what happened. I'm not saying that there was this sort of pogrom against, um, you know, Bonapartists. But um, I'm sure there might have been some violence, but the bottom line is that uh, 1816 uh, was a, a period of consolidation of power. And it was clear to him, anyway, that they were trying to get the statue and the Carta de Transmissiones. Now, I, I, I do believe, however, that the re I think the number one political reason for it was because the king was afraid of what it represented. Because, as I told you, it represents everything that a right-wing Catholic monarch would detest. 
which would be freedom and human rights and all this other stuff, and also the, the Napoleonic uh, vision of France as a kind of democratic empire. Quick uh, perspective of the question, and I might be jumping ahead a little bit, though I think this is sort of maybe around the, uh, you know, around the time or maybe shortly before, but at some point there is uh, uh, a bit of a schism in the Order of the Temple portion between the, between different factions within the Order of the Temple, one being the more Roman Catholic folks who didn't want to do the Jonah thing with the Jonah Church, and then of course the Jonah loyal uh, Templars. And I was wondering, you know, with with this, with the, with the Roman Catholic monarch, you know, when the, with the pendulum swinging in the opposite direction, um, you know, is there a possibility that, you know, those splits, uh, however brief, would be connected or just coincidental? Yeah, I mean, definitely there, there are, um, it's, it's entirely conceivable that, uh, you know, a person who was, because everyone who was a high-ranking member of the Order of the Temple was an extremely illustrious person in his own right, right? Yeah. Um, and it, it's, it's conceivable that that would happen. Uh, and sort of, yeah, 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 it definitely. Or planting the idea in some in, in a courtier, yeah. in a courtier's uh, ear. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that, that's perhaps maybe what happened. Um, somehow he had to get wind of it, but <laughs> it's not like they were in secret, right? I yeah. mean, they were holding these these um, meetings, as I said, plain light of day and clearly very very much part of the Napoleonic vision <coughs> of a new world order or a new French order at least a new European order any other questions or, or comments at this point okay. so the period between 1816 and 1830 is very very difficult for Dr. Felbert Falafra, but he continued to do very much the same things that he was doing. He, he didn't lose out in his social life or his, you know, his participation in a lot of the organizations of the day and his uh, practice and his research. He, he spent most of his time um, between, um, we say between 1815 uh, and 1830 on his medical research, you know, in his day-to-day -day work, between that and the and the clinic. And then something happened which gave him great hope. And this is this has everything to do with the Joanite Church. Because during that period of reflection and work in the community, um, I think that his idea his idea and his research kind of grew within him. Um, that the idea that the Joanite Church needed to be not only open, but something that should that whose time had come, basically. And it just so happens that in July of 1830, uh, there was what is commonly known as the July it started the the sort of um, Re July Revolution, uh, which was the beginning of a liberal constitutional monarchy under Louis Philippe. And um, so with the July Revolution of 1830, also known as the Three Glorious Days, um, you see a period of French history which is extremely tumultuous. There's one regime after another. Um, but the July monarchy for him uh, in 1830 was really a sign of hope because um, the, the last king was not the one that was uh, perse persecuting him, but the, Charles X uh, was extremely unpopular. Uh, and so Louis Philippe, uh, who was uh, from the liberal Orléans branch of the House of Bourbon, proclaimed himself not the king of France, the roi de France, but the, the I know this sounds like semantics, but he called himself the roi des Français, which means the king of the French, which has a political connotation, which was that they were preserved, he was preserving 
sovereignty of the people as one of the, if not the most important organ or representative uh, within the kingdom. And so he was clearly sending a message that he was going to be a constitutional monarch and that this was going to be a, an age of more freedom. So that would have been great had it not been for the fact that the war and the, the, well, the, the conditions of after, after that revolution and uh, pandemic of cholera had been spreading from east to west from India and hit the streets of Paris in 1832. Dr. Dr. Fabri Palakrat threw himself yet again into working to uh, clean, to, to heal the city of the cholera pandemic, which uh, originated in India uh, many years before and reached Paris around the 20th of March, 1832, killing more than 13,000 people in April alone. The pandemic would last until September 1832, killing a total of 100,000 people in France, with 20,000 of that in Paris alone. So, the, the cholera also struck, uh, for example, the, it, it didn't know class boundaries. The, the royal princess Adelaide was, uh, was killed by it, as well as some prominent politicians. Um, he treated these people, you know, cholera is a little bit like the norovirus. Which you know something about. Which I know all about. <laughs> um, it's pretty ugly. It never stops and it's, it spreads very quickly. And um, it's very easy to catch. And he was working for over a month or two without taking any rest. And then he finally got it and wound up, he didn't die, obviously, but he was very ill, and I believe he was, he had to convalesce for about six months, almost to a year, before he was back on his feet again. For that, he received, uh, for that, and he wrote a poem, and he wrote a poem, which was published in the newspaper, and started a foundation to help people who had been, hope, help, this is very interesting, and, and very much uh, Fabri Palafrat style, which raised money to help victims of the July Revolution on both sides. So people who had been wounded, families that had been shattered, widows and orphans of people who were on both sides um, would receive money from that. That's how he got the gold medal from the city of Paris. Um, so that that is pretty much his life his his life up to um, the 1830s and um, his work continued for both the church and uh, in medicine for a few years after that he became, he, the, the latter part of his life was actually very sad. Um, he was married and he and his wife moved. They, they were in Paris and you know, all these things were going on. And it was of course, the, the, the early part of the 1830s is when all of these publications came out. So if you look online, if you, if you want to look at all the Politicon and everything, everything is dated after 1831. The reason is because it wasn't until 1831 that this church was legal. So that whole idea of actually the revolution easing things up, it wasn't legal. Um, it probably could have been for a while, but the politics was so uh, tumultuous that it, it didn't get around to being legal until, until the 1830s. So that's why you'll see the, the great bulk of um, uh, publications from the July Church began on or about 1831. But sadly, as I said, he the the spiritual tr transition or the um, growth of Dr. Faber Palafrat and many of the members of the order was not uh, parallel. And there were schisms. There there was actually what he said. Okay, 
the Jonai Church is going to be a separate entity and it's going to open itself to the public um, as opposing, or at least as, not, you know, I say opposing, but as a, an alternative to Rome, people started bolting. And it caused all kinds of problems, both in the church and, and um, the order. Keep in mind that all the high-ranking, all the high-ranking uh, officials and bishops uh, in the church were members of the order, because the order is what sort of was the vehicle for the church. So, um, yeah, it's not a very happy end. Ending. He, he, I mean, he didn't. It could have been worse, but uh, I think that he was very, he was tired of the infighting, he was tired of um, being betrayed. There were, there were lots of stories of, of, of different bishops and different people in the Order of the Temple who, who betrayed him and who, who accused him of all kinds of things. And I think that's probably where a lot of the negative um, stuff comes from. So that there, at that point, I think people thought that um, you know, being a sovereign pontiff in actual fact and actually acting like it in public was somehow not cool. I don't know if they were embarrassed by it. Or, I mean, you can use your own imaginations, but um, it, it, it really weighed on him the rest of his life. But he wasn't going to, he never gave up. And the church continued. Um, it didn't, it wasn't extremely successful. Uh, and it was eventually merged with the Iglesia Gnostic Universal uh, much later, many years after he died. But he moved, he was able to move, he left Paris, he moved back to um, his country, if you will, um, in the southwestern part of France. And uh, he lived in the city of Pau Pau, which is in the Pyrenees on the border of Spain and France, yes? I was just going to mention that my predecessor made the claim that not all of it merged. Yeah. But some of it went. Oh, okay. You know, one to one and, and continued to the thing. And then he, he disputed say, the, the authority of the people involved to actually subsume it into something else, but that's not clear. It's not clear? Yeah, it's not clear. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's never been. It's uh, never nothing been from clear. that. Uh, uh, yeah. This is why I sort of, I'm not going to focus too much on the intrigues of the church at this point because it's, yeah. it, it's very muddy there, there, and it's not, it, I'm not really giving yeah. it, I'm not giving the church history. There, there, there are a couple different, you know, lineages at that point and one of them goes through the possible merger and one of them goes around it. And it was the one that went around it, my predecessor said, you know, that was the one, but both, uh, uh, both continue on to the present. So. So Joseph Van Pelletan, for example, was uh, supposedly the, he was the grandmaster. Yeah. Yeah. Um, who, I don't know if any of you are interested in symbolism, but I'm a big symbolism fan, symbolist uh, art. No, uh, most of us here don't care for symbols. So anyway, he, uh, yeah, Joseph Van Pelletan was, uh, was a, a bright and shining star in the in the symbolist movement, and uh, very interesting playwright, author. Uh, in addition to um, to being the stimulus for for many um, artists around him, and I think you know, uh, truth be told, probably should do something about him because he's. He is a really awesome character, yeah. and, and I think uh, very much embodies. Although he was much more artsy than Fabre Palapart, but Fabre Palapart was very much a, a, a he, he very much enjoyed and appreciated art, obviously, and he spent quite a lot of his own free time um, in 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 the arts, working for the arts, supporting them. So anyway, he's he, I think he's one of the brightest stars that comes out of the firmament, the late Joanite firmament, let's say in the eighteen eighties. So it's not true, it's not, it's not really accurate to say that, well, Dr. Fabre Palafrant died and so did his church, mm -hmm. or, or the order, and it's just not true. Um, it, 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 died, it sort of went, it faded away, um, and uh, you can read up on the, on the history of the ecclesiology of that, uh, I'm not gonna go through it, but just to say that 
he he died um, at home, um, presumably happy. His wife was still there, and uh, on the 18th of February, 1838. The interesting thing about his death and the translation of the authority and uh, articles of his offices as both the Grand Master of the Order of the Temple and as uh, the Sovereign Pontiff of the German Church is uh, that he left his, well, the, the person who succeeded him was the British Admiral Sir Sidney Smith, who very ironically was involved in the transportation of Allied troops to Flanders to invade Paris in 1814. He, um, as was the, the tradition in those days, uh, worked for other monarchs as an admiral, as a tactician, when, they're, when the British weren't having wars, which I don't know what that was, but um, he worked for the King of Sweden. And uh, he, he worked, uh, when he was working as an admiral, uh, he was forced to do a lot of things which were extremely expensive, which put him in debt in England. And England had not repealed its debtor laws. So he could not go home because he wasn't paid by the British government what they owed him. Because if he had gone home, he would have been put in prison as a debtor. That's an admiral. That's an admiral. That's awesome. So instead of uh, instead of well going to debtor's prison, he moved to France. <laughs> and he actually he was a he was. So a, wait, the a British Mason. government owed him money, but he couldn't go and get the money because the British government would put him in jail. No, because they had they weren't they had no intention of paying him right away. Ah. And had he been there, he would have been put in debtor's prison. I was just going to, uh, there was one other thing I wanted to add from a bit earlier, and especially uh, uh, mentioning uh, uh, what Father Donald just mentioned about Father Donald, is that uh, 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 Cersei's, or at least the, 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 the stream in which uh, Timothy Elgin heads, goes through Father Donald. And uh, interesting enough, I think also the uh, King of Sweden. Oh, really? Yeah, and you mentioned there was a. I can't remember the thing. I'd have to look back at the stuff that I sent you that, that uh, Tim sent me. And That's also the, uh, the divergent streams for the Joanite Church, one that went into the Bisnos Deep in the Moselle, and the one that didn't. Mm -hmm. The one that didn't it goes around. That's actually the one that we missed off in the Moselle. So, there's that. Was indeed, so, and we don't it's mention the but they, they, I mean, there's yeah, no doubt that the, peop the, the people that he had around him so that had, were in the order were very, very influential people from their own countries, including yeah. one monarch, the two, actually. Yeah. Um, George the, the Sixth? Uh, fifth. Sorry, fifth. George the... No, George the Fourth. George the Fourth. So I think some of the Fourth, some of the Fifth, but George of Hanover. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so in 1867, uh, the at the 80th session, of the of the order of the temple, uh, it decreed that the archives of the order be sent to London. They were supposed to be sent to the court of Saint James for a safekeeping. Um, according to the source, anyway, um, only the charter was sent to London. The rest being filed with the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris in 1871. So that's the answer to a question that someone asked me a year ago. I mean, we, we knew where the, the Carta Transmissiones had gone, but we, I did not know where the rest of the archives and documents had gone. So if you want to see the originals, you have to make an appointment at the Bibliothèque Nationale de France in Paris, <laughs> and they'll probably let you see it. So I, with that, I will um, I will open it up to, to further questions or comments. So conclave next year in Paris. <laughs> no, <it is. laughs> uh, I don't have a question, but it's a general comment. It's not a suggestion. I'm not looking for an answer. I'm just taking it up for a vote. But all those in favor? <laughs> well, I just don't want to come across as like a suggestion. But 
I would support at some point in the future. I know that our institutional narrative is a historical document, but we are the history of the future. And I would support in some way adding a paragraph to that to continue the story. Uh, that is this, you know what I mean? That what happens after that, you know what I mean? So, and, and, and it's not a boring paragraph, obviously. It's, it's <laughs> very detailed, it's very, um, it's very important. Um, so I'm just throwing it out there. To, to, to what? To the to the term. institutional narrative. Yeah. Oh, to the institutional narrative. I see. Yeah. yeah, in the liturgy. I'm not saying we've changed uh, the job. I was going to say I think that the Mark Mason Hall might frown on the, <laughs> on writing a paragraph on the Church of Jesus. Yeah, I know. but I just mean in our liturgy to continue on. Challenge accepted. For a future generation. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be more tempted to steal it than to it. But yeah, that's a that's a, that's a cool idea. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I was just going to mention the Ram when you mentioned the 1870 and things being shipped out of town that actually was around the, uh, the I guess we'll call it the non the non absorbed uh, language that's around the same time that that officially gets transmitted I think out of um, Joanna Templar hands and it just goes in the original distribution not all of which were or John with the uh, um, you know one of the last names you see in the in the litany before uh, my predecessor is uh, Debrino, mm -hmm. who lived to be like hundred years old. He lived he lived into the time of Cornell and Braco and all of them, but he was consecrated in the eighteen century uh, by all accounts, yeah, I mean he lived to be a really damn old hundred years or something. So that that transmission stuff is happening at the same time that uh, uh, documents were being yeah. shipped around. Like it, it seemed to me originally a long time ago before you know before uh, uh, you know I had the, the the resources obviously of, of having a scholar and a translator on, on one hand, and of course a connection involved with Circe's that I thought it just kind of you know trickled down to a a couple of people, the rest gave up, and then people just, you know, transmitted it hand to hand until somebody wanted to do something with it. But you see the activity of the Order of the Temple, and possibly, though not, you know, out in the open, activity of the Jonah Church almost up until, you know, the time of the, the Restoration. Mm -hmm. You know, and everybody. That's the other thing I find that interesting is that it'll be points of course to um, 1890 or 1892. Right? Um, you know, as the big, you know, hey, everybody, Gnosticism is back, but you've got this thing where, you, have, you know, even though they didn't necessarily use the word Gnostic, you've got this stream that's been going on for the better part of the century. Well, that's the, that's an interesting time. question, though. I mean, what, uh, I know that's not part of your talk here, but what parts of the primitive Christian church were, you know, would we recognize as Gnostic? Mm -hmm. I think that he, I think that, um, Based on what he wrote, he was writing internally and to other people, letters and things like that. That you know the the idea of Gnosticism as we understand it now, of course, is not not very clearly understood. Sure. Yeah. Um, but um, but clearly the he saw they he knew um, that this represented the undercurrent of Christianity, the secret. Uh, Things that had not been told, mm -hmm. and uh, that it was very much the, the reason that this went sort of hand in hand with the politics of his politics, his Bonapartist human rights type politics, is because the freedom of the individual to seek out the divine is part of the freedom of the individual to speculate. And um, he was really, really, really committed to that. I mean, I can't overemphasize his the importance that he placed on free inquiry and freedom of belief. Um, which is why, you know, sort of Masonic. I think it's very Masonic the way that the question and answer goes. But if you look at the question and answers, they're really very symbolic. You know, they're not sort of, you know, do you believe that Jesus Christ was a man who was, who actually died and actually rose, but none of that is there, it doesn't, there, it, well, I mean, 
it takes on a very different tone. Is that is that what you're working on for the next edition? So it's an esoteric. I don't I don't know. I mean, it's it's def he's definitely an esoteric Christian. There's no yeah, question in my mind it, about that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, I think there's esoteric and maybe even perhaps at least rather than see you know the cult overtones. There's certainly the idea, at least for the you know what I was able to see, about you know the presence of the divine within the constitution of you know humanity. You know, a kind of. Um, but that could be said to not be out of line with Freemasonry, right? Rather right. than being Gnosticism itself. But I mean, there, there are certainly you know things that I would think that were referential, things that could be inspired for the sake of play. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for example. But uh, my French is crap. So, <laughs> but know, I do. But I find yeah. it interesting that he did not, uh, as far as I've seen anyway so far, a man who with the name Bernard Raymond. You know, I don't know if any of you know this, but so the Raymond is a very very important name in the southwest of France because. It's the name of the last count, who was the vassal of the king of Aragon, and he was also a protector of the Cathars, who were right, the medieval mm -hmm. Gnostics, right? Um, in the world-hating variety. <laughs> uh, and there, you know, there's a lot of mention of them in the Restoration period. Especially for now, right? All of the Catholics, yeah. and then they did this, and the Bogomils, and um, not a whole lot of talk about that from him. And he's from there, you know. He's literally from a few miles from Albi, so I'm, I'm sure he knew about it, right? I mean, it's yeah. not it's it's not that nobody knew about it, but um, I think he was much more I think he was much more influenced by, as you say, the esoteric and um, and Kabbalistic even. Yeah. Uh, studies that he, I'm sure he had uh, undertaken. As well, there, there, there is even, uh, you know, uh, not always explicit, but there is a very capitalistic, very yeah. Jewish uh, overtone and undertone to a lot of the, uh, you know, a lot of the Order of the Church's documents. I mean, they worked off a separate lunar calendar, you know what I mean, for, for their official stuff, which, you know, it was a lunar, you know, it was a lunar calendar, but they dated it from the Order of the Temple. To, to the present day at the time, and you know, even the, uh, you know, um, I mean the, uh, you know, Levites, Levi, the idea of, of uh, priesthood. I mean, all the, it seemed to have very kind of. Uh, 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 this is a whole separate, <laughs> separate yeah, thing. You know solution. what I mean? That the, there was definitely the inclusion of, of those, uh, uh, you know, elements in there. You know, at least in. Uh, in, in, in my opinion, mm -hmm. uh, not but, to be some other priesthood, but the restoration of the true mm -hmm. priesthood. But I think, in terms of the of the uh, the concept of gnosis, yes. And uh, and personally, I just think it's wonderful that he was so uh, interested in the Egyptians, of course, because that's yeah. that, was, uh, that was France. <laughs> Well, yeah, yeah, right. I mean, but you know, the the uh, some of the biggest discoveries were going on, mm -hmm. you know, because of Napoleon's uh, conquest when he conquered uh, the northern part of Egypt. I mean, you know that the, they were the uh, Champollion is, is like the god. He's the grandfather of all Egyptologists, you know, and uh, a man who he knew, you know. Well, mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's it's really interesting to see. So I think I can see why he felt that, um, you know, as he said that kabbalistically, sort of like the stars were in, in the right place for this to, to come out yeah. in his lifetime. Because um, well, look what happened. I mean, it's kind of like the way uh, you, you we can look at Christianity as being, um, uh, the, you know, the first century or the change the change in millennia is, is uh, that you have the right conditions. For a universalist type religion to take root, because it's already happening. People are already talking about it. The the ether is there. You know, the, all the things are right in the Roman Empire. Travel, you know, you can go from one place to another really quickly, relatively quickly, um, and uh, all these things are right. All the thinking has come to the this kind of idea, so you can sort of graph them together. It works. You know, I think that he felt that. The Napoleonic era represented just such a configuration, you know. So in that sense, I think that he was definitely 
not a happy camper when he died because I think he was just really upset with and very, very uh, embittered by the petty foolishness of um, of the esoteric community. And, and None of that happens today. <laughs> <laughs> it's so good that we'll be on that now. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, it's exactly, I could just, I know because I get the same sick feeling in my stomach every time an Indian Catholic or other Gnostic, you know, church does something stupid. Uh, it's just, I'm sure he felt, you know, that yeah. way ten times over because he was the one who started it, you know, in a way. But uh, but it's completely not in that. You know, the, what attracts me to Father Palapart is not so much. Um, I mean, what he did was great, but how he did it is even better. Because he was able to maintain a balance between his responsibilities as a member of his community and as a, as a you know um, and as a Frenchman, um, as a doctor, and I presume as a, you know as a person who who cared for his own family. Yeah, he slept two hours a night whether he needed it or not. <laughs> and, you know, it, it, he, he was dedicated to, to those things as a living practice of his spirituality. Uh, you know, the mindfulness that we have, that we teach, you know, that we try to show people in the, in the Jonite community is, is very much, it's based on him. It's, it's clear, it comes out very clearly in the, in the, in the, the way that we are today. So I hope that I did him a little bit of justice anyway. It's <laughs> really great to, to, to be able to share some of that stuff with you. So thank you very much. Thank you.